thank you, Lord, for loving me, and thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Good morning. It is a wonderful morning to be here. I know that the seasonal crud has been passing through my family uh, and kept us away from the, from, the, from the family here, and it is great to be back for me. I'm sure that many of you fall into that camp as well. A um, few announcements uh, before we enter into worship this morning. First, if you could break out your phone, scan the QR code, gives us a record of your attendance. It also has a place for you to have any prayer requests if you need some and you want to put it in there. But it helps keep a, a, a record of your attendance. I know that, that we have a lot of visitors here. It's a, long, it's a long weekend, vacation weekend. We welcome you if you are visitors here. You are our, our honored guests. And, and I hope that you stick around after. Let some of our members uh, introduce themselves, get to know you a little bit better uh, while, while we're here today. Uh, next, if you are like me and forget your emblems uh, for the Lord's Supper, that will happen a little bit later. If you could at this time raise your hand, and we have a few men at the back who will get those to you uh, here and here shortly. So if you could raise your hands there. Couple announcements this morning. Um, we have a new Bible study opportunity that kicks off this Saturday. One of our Bear Valley Bible Institute students, uh, Byron Buzan, uh, will be conducting a bi-weekly Bible study uh, on, on Saturdays. It starts this Saturday, September 9th, from 6.30 to 8, 8 o'clock. Uh, the name of his study is called Lifelong Zeal, and it's really geared towards young adults, but all are welcome. Again, it's here at the church building on Saturdays, every other Saturday. Um, the elders want to uh, reach out to the, the church and, and, and hopefully get some volunteers. We're going to be going back to passing the trays for the Lord's Supper, so you're not going to hear me talk about uh, needing the little plastic, plastic things, but we do need volunteers. So if there's men in the congregation who would be willing to help out with passing the trays as we transition to that, let one of the elders know or one of the preachers know and we'll get you on that list. Uh, beginning on September 6th, there's going to be two adult Bible classes in the chapel here at the building. Uh, the first is a, a study of Deuteronomy by Donnie Bates called Hero Israel. And in the fellowship hall, um, we're going to have a, another one called Israel's Songbook with the Bear Va Valley uh, Bible Institute upperclassmen presenting this. It's, it's going to be uh, a study on Psalms. Uh, just a couple more, men's prayer breakfast this Saturday, or Saturday on September 9th. If, you, if the men haven't been going to the men's prayer breakfast, it is really an uplifting time. It is a great morning. It's a great time to be with other you know, men of the church, get to know them, be immersed in God's word and prayer. So I would highly recommend that you go to those. Uh, next week is Missions Week, uh, September 10th through the 13th. Uh, and we're going to have some of our missionaries come in and do, do reports and, and, and tell us and update us on, on the, uh, what's going on there. You know, we're, we have a lot of things going on, so it's always nice to hear from, from our missionaries. Of course, please, there's a lot more stuff. Pick up a bulletin. There's a lot of things in there, all the happenings going on. There's a lot of people that are out with illnesses, with sickness or shut-ins. They're all, all in here today. But, of course, we are here to worship our God. And I, I like to always think about new ways to come up with, with old phrases and, and turn, of, turn of phrases, but sometimes being direct is, is best. And we worship our God because he is worthy to be worshipped. It, it is his really ever-present and selfless love that made it so that he sent Jesus to die on a, on a cruel, cruel cross for the forgiveness of our sins and the hope of everlasting life. So let us sing together, let us worship our Lord because he is worthy of our praise. If it's a me, would you please stand while we sing our first song? 
This morning, our song service is going to focus on love and how we can build a loving community. We praise the old God. morning. Do you realize this is the first day of the rest of your life? Yesterday is history, but today and onward is under the control of you and our Lord and Savior. Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? My guess is most of you are, because you're here. You're having fellowship with fellow Christians studying God's word and worshiping our Lord and Savior. What a great and rewarding thing to do. Would you pray with me? 
Oh, Lord, thank you for this delightful day that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, for our families, our friends, our livelihood, and your Holy Spirit. Father, help us to remember that as Christians, we are privileged. Not only does your word give us sound and specific directions to live our lives, but we also have forgiveness when we fail to live up to that wonderful scripture you have shared with us. Father, this brotherhood is so blessed with the wonderful elders, deacons, preachers, teachers, and all of their wives that you have gifted us with. Help us go out of our way to thank them, assist them, and to pray for each of them for all of their extreme efforts. O oh, Holy One, we come to you with many who are suffering from medical issues and other personal needs. Please heal and comfort each and every one. We have travelers, we have people without jobs, and we have many other issues among us. Father, if it is your will, fulfill their needs and give them safety and happiness. Finally, dear Lord, give us boldness to share our word with our families, with our neighbors, and the leaders, so they will be able to use your word to guide their households, our state, our country, and this world. We ask all of these things in holy, Christ's holy name. Amen. How sweet, how heavenly. This morning, we're going to sing, I gave my life for thee.
We read in the Bible about what Christians did in the first century every first day of the week. They came together to praise God for the blessings, for the hope, for the joy that we have in Christ. To pray together and to give to help in uh, prospering the work of the kingdom of God. And they came together to partake of the Lord's Supper. And that's what we're going to do now. And if you don't have one of these uh, uh, containers, please raise your hand. I know some of you may have come in after the announcements. and We'll have someone bring that to you. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19, Jesus said, This do in remembrance of me. And as I pointed out from time to time when I've had the privilege of standing before you, I often challenge my own mind and find it maybe a little bit challenging to think about, well, what all can I focus on to help guide my thoughts? And there are various things that I do. I want to share with you one more this morning from John chapter 18. Do you have your Bibles open up there? Because I believe in pointing out just a few things here from this text this morning that it will help us to better remember Jesus and what he did for us. And I've tied this to four different locations of things that happened during this Passion Week and, yea, this last day of his earthly life as a, uh, in the pre-resurrected state. The first one is in John chapter 18, verse 1, where we find that Jesus was in the garden. Other gospel accounts refer to it as Gethsemane. And in Gethsemane, remember that Jesus prayed, Father, let this cup pass for me, not my will, but thine be done. But let's remember this morning that the word Gethsemane means the place of the press. There was literally an olive press and an olive vineyard found at this area that is called the Mount of Olives, but down below at a place Gethsemane. And as we remember that place, let's remember the sweat drops of blood that came from the brow of Jesus, that just as those olives were under this enormous pressure from that great stone that would crush them, so Jesus was under an enormous amount of emotional pressure knowing what would lie ahead. And he prayed through the night, but went and willingly gave himself, saying, Father, not my will, but thine be done. He did that for you. And for me, the second place, as we think about and remember Jesus, is at the Praetorium in chapter 18, verse 28. The Praetorium where, is where the highest ranking Roman official could be found and where Jesus was brought and scourged. He was mocked. A crown of thorns was placed upon his head. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And where Jesus received stripe after stripe after stripe from the hand of a lictor who brought that whip across his body and where his bruised and bleeding, bludgeoned body suffered receiving your stripes and my stripes. I think about Jesus at the praetorium and then I think about him if you turn over to John chapter 19 and look at verse number 12. Well, then he was brought to the place of the pavement at verse number 13 called Gabbatha. A place where Pilate said, Behold, the man. Is this your king? And at that place, this is where the crowd, as we read in verse 15, said, the Bible says, They cried out and they said, Away with your king. Crucify him. The mockery, the shame, the sadness of that event that the very people that belong to God would reject the king of kings and their redeemer and their greatest friend. And then the fourth place that I like to think about as I remember Jesus in partaking the Lord's Supper it's found in verse number 17, the place called Gagatha. In Aramaic, it means the place of the skull. 
We don't know why for sure that it was called that. It could be because of the geographic location resembling a skull. It could be because that's where skulls were found because of the numerous deaths, the crucifixions that had taken place there at the hands of the Romans. Whatever the reason, it was called Golgotha. The imagery of that skull of a place of death ought to resonate in our hearts and our minds because it was the place where Jesus drew his last breath suspended between heaven and earth upon that cruel cross he satisfied the judgment and the justice of God and by his grace then and his love and his mercy we are saved Golgotha, Calvary, the place of crucifixion where Jesus endured an agonizing, a horrific, a shameful death for you and for me. Let's remember the body and the blood of Jesus this morning. Our Father and our God. You are beautiful beyond description. And too marvelous for words. Thank you for this bread that reminds us of the body of Jesus and the brutality of what he endured in Gethsemane, at the Praetorium, at Golgotha, Help us to remember that this morning. In the name of Jesus, our risen Savior, we pray. Amen. And in like manner, he took the cup, he blessed it, that is, he gave thanks for it, and he said to his disciples, all of you drink it. This is my blood of the New Testament that was shed for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this cup which reminds us of the blood at Calvary that redeems us. In the name of Jesus, our risen Savior, we pray. Amen.
Jesus taught us many things by the way that he lived his life and how he gave his life. But he also taught us, as Paul recorded in the book, or as Luke recorded in the book of Acts, as Paul met with the elders of Ephesus at Miletus, when he said, I have instructed you in all things, how that you ought to help the poor, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how it is more blessed to give than to receive. We've been blessed in so many ways, have we not? Blessed with the hope of salvation, blessed with so many material things, and yet we have the privilege of giving to others and helping others and giving to the work of the church so that the good news of Jesus and remembering what we've talked about today can be told over and over and over again to generations to follow and to countries around the world, and yea, people right here in our very own communities. They need the gospel. And so let us remember the privilege that we have to give in these various ways that are on the overhead here. And let's pray, and then we will sing a song and give you that opportunity to give. God, thank you so much for all that you've given us. You are so good to us, God. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand while we sing the song just before the lesson.
This morning's reading is from John, 13th chapter, verses 31 through 35. Judas has just left the supper. And when he'd gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you, and you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Be seated. Thank you, Dean. Good morning, church. So good to see you all here. I know we have some who are visiting with us today. Uh, some have just moved to the area, or maybe you're, uh, uh, you're just passing through. We are so grateful that you've decided to come and spend this time of worship with us this morning. We are in the final lesson of a study that we've called Increasing Our Grip Strength. And the idea behind it is, is simply that there are certain jobs in, in this world, in life, that, that your hands need to be strong enough to get it done. Whether that means that you are a, a, a manual labor kind of person with, with uh, farming or construction or whatever, or, or if it's in recreational terms, you like to rock climb or you like to swing golf clubs, whatever it is, it, it, there are times that you need a good solid grip strength. And if you don't have that grip strength, then you realize pretty quickly you're not going to be able to get the job done, at least not in the way that you want to have it done. And we've seen this playing out, and what we've done is we've recognized that in a spiritual sense, the Lord's church in the last handful of decades has been wrestling with what I think we could call a weak grip strength. For, numerous, for multiple decades, we've seen a steady decline in people in this country and in, and in uh, environments like the U.S. that people are walking away from their faith. They're letting go. They're not holding on. Churches are having a hard time holding on to those members and those souls that God has sent their way. And so in this study, we've been spending some time uh, kind of looking from a, from a bird's eye view. How can the church increase our grip strength on those souls that God has brought our way? And as we come into this last lesson, I'd like to, I'd like to begin with a question. Show of hands if you would. How many of you have ever felt lonely? Yeah, I expect to see probably most every hand in the room go up. Now, let me alter this question just a little bit. You don't have to raise your hand this time. But how many of you have ever felt true loneliness? Now, as I change that question, perhaps a couple of you, perhaps some of you are going, okay, Corey, wait, what, what's the difference? I felt lonely, but, but what do you mean by true loneliness? I, I've come to believe that there are two primary types of loneliness in life. The first is what I'm, I'm going to term it circumstantial loneliness, and it, it's merely or simply those times where we literally find ourselves alone. Okay, we've been out playing when we're kids. We're out playing and, and we're having a good time. And all of a sudden, all the moms say, hey, come on in, time for supper. And all of a sudden, you're left alone. You don't have anybody to play with anymore. You don't have anybody to call. And maybe, and we experience that even as we move into adulthood. You know, we're... We get to those points where we'd love to give somebody a holler and say, hey, you want to go grab a burger or go grab a cup of coffee or go see a movie or something? And, and just people are not simply not available. And you find yourself in the circumstance of being alone. And, and at that point in time, you're lonely. But in many ways, we perhaps could say a lot of those times, we're, we're, really, we're bored is what it is. And I just don't have anybody to spend some time with. True loneliness, though, I believe is a different matter. Because true loneliness would be tied to that basic human need of belongingness. Now that's a, 
big fancy word. I promise I didn't make it up. It, it, it's out there in, the literature, in literature. The idea of belongingness or the need to belong is often described as that human emotional need to affiliate with and be accepted by a group. That I know that there is a body of people somewhere that I can count myself a part of. They, they have brought me in, they have wrapped their arms around me, and I know that I belong with them. And so when you think about that definition of belongingness, and then you flip that around to try to figure out what true loneliness is, true loneliness describes a condition in which we lack a group where we feel accepted. We are truly alone. And there have, been, there have been various studies about this all throughout, you know, throughout the last several decades. In 2020, Harvard Magazine uh, put out a, a, an article, and one of the comments that was made in this article is that social psychologists define loneliness as the gap between the social connections you would like to have and those that you feel like you experience. Here's what I would like to have happen, but this is what real life is like in my heart and in my mind and in my perception. It's kind of like the idea when you meet somebody that they say they have a lot of friends or they seem to have a lot of friends, and yet when they talk about all of the relationships they have, when they talk about all the friendships that they seem to have, they continually come back to a statement along the lines of, but I don't really feel like anybody knows me. Or I, I don't really feel close to many people. When we think about this feeling of loneliness, it's actually rather widespread throughout our modern Western culture. According to a 2018 report by the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation, 22% of adults in the United States, 22% often say, say they often or always feel lonely or socially isolated. It's 2018, that's pre-COVID. In 2019, another organization put out a group in which their number, uh, their number signified, uh, reported that 61% of Americans report feeling lonely at time, at some point in their life. Now, we could get into the details of is that circumstantial or is that true loneliness. I'm not, I'm not worried about that at the moment. But my, my point is to say that it's very widespread for people to feel lonely or to feel alone in this world at times. And this is a serious matter that doesn't need to be dismissed because there are also numerous other studies that demonstrate that a prolonged sense of loneliness can contribute to mental health concerns like anxiety, social anxiety, depression, hopelessness, and suicidal thoughts. Whereas the inverse has also been found true that those who have a sense of belongingness find relief from those kinds of mental health concerns. Now, take all of that information that we just rattled off, and let's ask the question, how does that apply to our study increasing our grip strength? And this is what I would suggest to you. The, the psychological studies that we read about today that have been going on for decades now are simply giving us data to what God has been teaching us in Scripture from the very beginning. You go all the way back to the creation. God creates Adam, the first man, and he breathes life into him and he becomes a living soul. But somewhere along the way, God looks down very quickly after Adam has been created and he says, behold, it is not good that the man should be alone. And we, you keep on reading and we know that woman comes in just a matter of a couple of verses after that. And then you have the, the beginning of the marriage relationship. But even if you take that on a much broader sense, the idea that it is not good for man to be alone Alone, communicates that when God created mankind, he created us as social beings. We are not intended to go through life by ourselves. We are intended to have a group of people 
that we belong to. And you see this play out in Israel's history, Israel, the chosen race of God. As you look at their society and even within their religious structure as God gave that to them, Israel's religious and national identities were anchored in the sense of community and family. Judaism was not an individualized religion. It was something to belong to in a corporate sense, as a group. In fact, you look very, if you, if you pay attention to the way that it's worded all throughout uh, the Mosaic Law, a person's individual identity was primarily derived from their family, their clan, and their tribe. They did not have the individualistic traits or set those up with as much importance as we do in American culture today. You got your identity from the family and the, na- and the nationality and the clan that you belong to. Which is why it was such a big deal in Scripture when someone is put out from the community. When you have been ostracized from your family and told that you are now no longer a part of this community. Why? Because that was your identity. That's where your purpose and meaning came from. And when we think about that on on the national level of Israel, what's interesting to me is that when God designs the church, he uses those same principles and that same basic structure to arrange his church. The term church as we have come to use it in English, is a collective term. Meaning that church refers to a collective whole of followers of Jesus. Church does not talk about an individual soul. And that could mean, that could mean the body of believers universally as in the, the world over. Or it could mean, even if you brought it down to an individual congregation, you're still talking about a body of believers at the church at Bear Valley. It's a collective term. You think about the most common images for the church in Scripture are what? The body and the family. And when you look at the the idea of the body, it's described in terms of the fact that the body is not just one big piece, but there's a lot of different members that come together to form a body. It's not a single-celled amoeba, right? It's all these different parts that come together to make the entirety. And then even in the idea of a family, you can't have family if you don't have multiple members. Otherwise, it's just you. But what we also find in Scripture, in the New Testament, when it comes to the church, is that the sense of belonging is supposed to be so strong within the Lord's church that it can also be used for correction. When someone fails to live up to the standard of behavior and the ethics that Jesus has called for. We call that process, in our modern terminology, we call that disfellowshipping. Passages like Matthew 18, 17, or 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 9 through 11, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14, and there are others that we could point to, describe situations in which someone's rebellious behavior is grounds to dismiss them from the church community, but to dismiss them with a certain goal. The goal is that they will have had something very precious taken away from them that will make them open up their eyes and say, I need to get back to living the way God has called me to live because I just had something very, very precious and very meaningful in my life taken away from me. And that is the belonging to the church family. And yet, what we see more and more is people walking away from the church, at least in part, I won't say that it's the entirety, but at least in part, they're walking away because it doesn't have that kind of meaning to them anymore. It's just another group. It's just another place to be. But they're not finding, I would suggest to you that one of the reasons that people are walking away from the church is because they don't find that sense of belonging Being satisfied that God created inside of them and that he created the church to be able to fulfill. 
they're struggling to find the level of acceptance and the level of welcome which creates a loyalty and a bond to the body of Christ. And so this morning, as we consider this idea of how the church increases its grip strength, we, you know, we, we've talked about the idea that in order to increase that grip strength, we, there's a need to learn, that is, understand the Word of God, understand how to live the life. We also talked about there's a need to work, there's a need to get busy letting that knowledge, that, that understanding actually change our lives. But, but this morning, in addition to learning and working, we in the Lord's church need to do some serious work at creating and sustaining a culture that satisfies the need for human belonging. We need to make sure that whether it's Bear Valley or it's some other congregations that, that you may normally uh, be a part of if you're just visiting with us today, that we are helping and working to create an environment in which people feel welcomed, where they feel wanted, and that they are a necessary part so what does that look like? What, what does that kind of environment need to, to be structured as? Thankfully, the Bible tells us what that kind of a culture looks like. And, and we can find it in, in what we've come to know as those one another passages in the New Testament. These are the sections of Scripture where inspired authors give us insight and at times instructions on how we are to teach uh, or how we are to interact and behave toward one another. That's the Greek word alelon uh, there, which is the term that's used. And it's used a hundred times in the New Testament. And, and 47 of these, almost half of them are specifically instructions. You do this to or for one another, or sometimes in the negative, you don't do this to or toward one another. And so this morning, as we look into all of those, I, we're, we're clearly not going to be able to go through all 100 of them, okay? That's, a, that's a, another study for another time. But I do believe that what we can do is, is take a step back and pull out some of the big threads. What are some of the major points that we find in the one another passages that would give us some insight into what a belonging church looks like? What does that culture that makes people feel wanted need to have within it? And the first thing that I would show, say to you, and I don't think it's going to be any surprise, is that we can identify a primary trait. You look through all 100 of those uses in the New Testament. Um, you look through all 100 of those, and there's one trait that really rises above all of them, and it's not going to be a surprise. It's where the Bible says that we are to love one another. It is the most repeated instruction within the one another passages. And we see this, we saw it in our scripture reading today, is really the, the first major place where Jesus says he's getting ready to go, uh, to go to his crucifixion and later he's going to be taken back up into heaven. He says, a new commandment that I'm giving to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, so you also ought to love one another. And by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Do you pick up on the pattern? And then as we keep on reading throughout, the, throughout the, the, the rest of the New Testament, this, was, this is found in the Gospel of John. Same apostolic author later on has 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he'll bring out this reminder in 1st and 2nd John at least four more times in, his, in the letters of 1st and 2nd John. Three times in 1st John, he talks about the, he reminds them about the idea that this is the commandment you had from the beginning that we are to love one another. He'll say the same thing in 2nd John. But in 1st John, he also kind of builds this idea that people are going to know that God abides in you and you abide in God, not if you are at church every Sunday, not if you read through the Bible in its entirety every year. He said, people will know that God abides in you if you have love for one another. And then Paul will repeat the teaching in passages like Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. And we can look at many, many others. But what we need to see is that a belonging culture is one that is anchored in this emotion of love for each other. 
Because this creates an environment that people want to be in. Where they are cherished and they are cared for. And I don't care how I, the, the toughest of toughest men want to be in an environment where they're loved. Even though they may never say it. No, 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 love, no, 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 no I'm, not, I'm not worried about love. You know, that, that's mushy stuff. Well, see, if you look at the word love and you say that I don't want that because that's mushy stuff, then you've bought in to the popular culture definition of love. Because love is not in and of itself mushy and awful and only for romance novels. Sometimes love's hard. Love is something that we all need because it has been grossly misinterpreted by media and straight use that oftentimes we forget and miss what it's really about. And so what I want to suggest to you is that we're, we're going to look at uh, a handful of other characteristics of the one and other passages of that belonging culture. But what I want you to be able to, to tie together is that all of these other characteristics are all anchored right here. If we love one another, then these are the kinds of things that are going to be present in our culture, in our environment within this family that are going to show that we love one another. And, and so one that I want you to consider is that it's this idea that if we love one another, then we're going to speak kindly to one another. What's interesting about it is that a lot of the speak kindly passages are actually stated in the negative. Don't do this. For example, Colossians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul says, do not lie to one another. That's a negative statement, right? Do not do this. Well, you can easily flip that around. If Paul is telling us that a belonging culture means that we don't lie to one another, then what does it mean that we do? We speak truth to one another. And you can keep on going through in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. And somebody said, well, Corey, that doesn't say anything about speaking kindly. Actually, it does, because you've got to back up a little bit. Here's the one another statement, to be kind to one another. But if you back up to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, you get kind of the running start. 32 comes on the heels of Paul having just said, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So he does talk about our language. Speak, speak in ways that build people up. Don't have nasty, dirty, corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but instead you need to be kind to one another. It involves the way we speak. And then the others look, uh, are, are much more in the, in the realm of the negative statements. Galatians 5.15, don't bite and devour one another. Avoid provoking and envying one another. James 4.11, do not speak evil against one another. James 5.9, do not grumble against one another. What I want you to see is that when it comes to the way that we talk... When it comes to the way that we interact with one another, the church should be a place where people know that they are going to be spoken well of and well to. People should not be coming to church, to the church and being afraid of being insulted or attacked. Why? Because we love one another. And we are going to speak to one another in a way that builds up. There are three or four other passages, uh, one another passages that we use the phrase encourage one another. And that begins in the way that we talk to each other. But I think we're also going to find through these one another passages that a welcoming, belonging culture has warmth and welcome to it. Four times throughout the letters... Paul tells his readers to greet one another with a holy kiss. And Peter will actually echo that same sentiment as well. Now, you say that in modern times and we kind of go, okay, that's a bit weird. All right, we, we, I, I'm not, you know, love you, John. I'm not going to walk up and plant a kiss on you, okay? It's just not the way it works. But, but even in our modern world, we can still kind of understand this. We've all seen movies, you've seen TV shows, and if you've been to, say, Europe, where they have a very different way of greeting one another, they'll walk up and they'll put a kiss on either side of the cheek. And, and yes, it's a very intimate gesture, especially in, in modern American 
uh, through modern American eyes, but you get the idea of warmth and welcome, and that's kind of the idea of what they're describing here. The, but, but the point overall, whether you're talking about a holy kiss or you want to put something else in, the idea is that Christians should be warm and welcoming to one another. Here at Bear Valley in our culture, that might take, that might take the, the form of a really good handshake or you walk up and you give someone a hug and your face lights up when you see them and you call them by name and you walk up and you chat with them for a couple of minutes. There's all kinds of things that we do in order to help somebody feel welcome. And I want you to think about the power that it has behind that. When you go into a church building or when you meet up at some other activity, doesn't it make you feel like you belong there when somebody says, oh, it's so good to see you. Come here. Doesn't that make you feel good? It should. It should. But there's nothing worse. There's very little that's worse than walking into a church building. And getting a cold reception. Walking in and you see all these people milling around. And maybe they're talking to everyone else. But nobody's talking to you. Nobody even acknowledges that you came. Or the most is like. And then they move on. Folks that's hard. And it makes somebody not want to come back. And so, and so here comes the big question. When you walked through this door today, when you, whether it was before class or if you, if you came for service, when you came in today, did you stop to try to talk to somebody and call them by name? And if you don't know their name, did you try to figure out what their name is? Did you shake their hand? Did you give them a quick hug? Did you spend some time helping them f- realize that I'm glad you're here? If you didn't, that's fine. You can hop out of here really quick and catch folks before they walk out the door and make sure that you do it before they leave. But one of the things that churches get criticized the most for, and it's not always misplaced criticism, is that people will come and they'll visit and they'll say, nobody talked to me. Nobody took time to, to get to know me. And I, and I don't think we have that problem at Bear Valley. I, I think we've gotten a whole lot better, especially since COVID. And, and when we got so excited about seeing people again, that, that we, we are a warm and welcoming congregation, but we can always be better. We can always be better. And if you happen to be one of those who says, well, I, I don't feel like anybody welcomes me, then, then I, I get that, but let me also make a challenge to you. If you don't feel like you are normally welcomed, let me make the challenge to you. Make sure you go and are welcoming to other people. You can start that as well. Be part of what makes the change and part of what makes the difference. So as we consider the idea of what does a, uh, what does a belonging culture Entail it entails this idea of being of, of warmth and welcome. But there's a third one that we get from those one another passages, and we get this notion of accountability. Maybe a little bit of a brash phrase that we don't like all the time, but it's the idea of holding people's feet to the fire. This is the idea where love becomes tough love. But it is a critical part. There are too many people in our world, and maybe some of us that are in this building right now or watching online, too many people have been duped into thinking that love means that anything I want is going to have to be accepted. And only the, the only people who love me are the people who never critique what I think, who never call me out for what I do. If you call me out, then you must hate me. That, that, that's a bad, bad misunderstanding of what love is. Because the reality is that many times true godly love requires that we confront someone about the sins and the mistakes that are harming their lives. I put up this verse, Galatians chapter 6 verse 2. It says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And you may think, Corey, that's a little bit of an odd verse to put up when you talk about the idea of accountability. But, but it's really not. Because you see, the thing is... is most of us, when we read Galatians 6, 2, we kind of take it by itself. And, and usually we apply this verse as helping people through hard times. And, and that's, a, that's a good application of it. Somebody's down on their luck with, with money and finances, so we help bear their burdens and we, we help them get through the, that financial hardship. Okay, yeah, that's a great application. However, the context does paint a little bit of a different picture. This is Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Do you know what verse 1 says? 
Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch over yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So at least one major application of that idea of bearing one another's burdens means that I'm not, if I love you, I'm not going to sit back and watch you ruin your life with sin and just pretend, well, I mean, it's their choice. They're just going to do what they want to do. I have no need to go. No, if I love you, I'm going to step in and I'm going to say something. Not because I have this need to, to be perpetually right. Not because I need to elevate myself above you. But because I love you too much to watch you ruin your soul. And I will help you bear that burden. Whatever that is. Because you belong here. We belong in the family together. And we have that mutual interest. And so there's the idea of accountability. And we could go to several other passages that that don't use the words one another, but that give us that same idea. That when your brother sins against you, you go talk to him. If he doesn't listen, then you go bring somebody as a witness. And if he won't listen to you, then you take it to the church, the body, the place where people belong. But a fourth and final one. When we think about the kind of, of church that is that belonging environment is we find that there's there's the element of challenge and betterment a belonging church is one where we are constantly trying to make each other better and you have passages that play this out hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 the hebrew author says that we need to stir up one another to love and good works older versions use the word provoke Provoke one another to loving. I hate, it, 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 it kind of gets me that it says provoke. But, I, but, but stirring up, provoking, I'm, I'm prodding along and say, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's get to work. Let's do this together. And so why am I going to do that? I'm going to challenge you to be better because when you get better, your faith gets stronger. And if I belong to you and as much as you belong to me as members of the body of Christ, then it's going to help me get better too. First Timothy, uh, I'm sorry, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. He uses that phrase, encourage and build each other up as you are doing. Keep on doing it all the more. And Colossians 3.16 talks a little bit about that idea. That says, that says we are to teach and admonish one another. In Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Our interaction is a constant challenge to be more, to be better, to grow stronger. And the thing is, is that when I belong to a body, when I belong to the church, and I have that sense, and I know others are going to try to encourage me and push me along to get better, when they stop caring whether or not I get any better, then maybe that means they don't care anymore. In our martial arts instruction uh, that the boys and I go do, uh, one of the stories or one of the illustrations that that our, our instructor Uh, Our sensei will talk about a lot. He says, over in Japan, it becomes a really big deal that uh, when you're in a class, when when your sensei calls you out and says, no, don't do this, do this. He says, they take a lot of pride in it. They swell up. He corrected me. He corrected me. He cares. He said, it's when the instructor stops correcting you that you realize he's probably given up on you. And if we're going to have a belonging culture in the church, then we need to make sure that all of this is part of it, that we are constantly encouraging and challenging one another to be better in our faith. The church is supposed to be that kind of entity. And what I want us to see in all of this is that that sense of belonging should never be in question when it comes to the Lord's church. He designed our family and our body to be a group where people know that they are welcomed, where they are wanted and can feel safe from attack and can grow into better followers of Jesus. The fact that our grip strength has weakened in the Lord's church in in recent decades should at least lead us to ask if the modern church is consistently fostering such an environment. At Bear Valley, Are we creating and sustaining that sort of atmosphere that people feel like they are a part and they belong here? 
And if you say no, again, let me give you that encouragement to be part of the solution. Don't just stand off to the side and complain about not feeling like you belong. Do things yourself that will help others feel welcomed and you will find your place in the meantime. If you say yes at Bear Valley, we have that, then my question to you is how can we get better? Can you broaden your circle of vision to include new members who are still finding their place? Or can you broaden your spectrum of vision to to include those that have been here for a long time at Bear Valley, but they're still sitting on the fringe and they haven't really fully been incorporated into what's going on in the body? Can you make a more concerted effort to greet the strangers among us and let them know that we're glad they're here? We need to make sure. We need to make sure that we are ever growing in this capacity. Because people stay where they belong. Jesus calls them to belong to his church. And we as the church have the responsibility to make them feel wanted. This is what creates a sense of loyalty to the Lord and to his body. And this is how we will increase our grip strength. And this morning it may be that you need a little bit of help and encouragement from this family. If there's sin in your life that you need help dealing with, that you need someone to help bear that burden, then don't wait. Come and let us know. You can come down front here in a moment, or you can meet somebody in the lobby, and we'll go into the offices if you need to meet privately. Or maybe you need to begin your walk with Jesus. You need to put Jesus on in baptism by obeying the gospel and start that walk and be added to his church so that you can belong to this family. Whatever the need is, you have an opportunity to do something about it now. And we hope that you will. Listen to the Lord's invitation. Let us help while we stand and sing. song this morning, of course, is going to be The Greatest Commands. Um, I hopefully, I think it fits, Corey. Um, before we sing this song, I'm going to read out of 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another.
It's a great day to worship our God, and we have just a couple last-minute things to share with you before we depart from this place. Uh, a couple of things. Next week, we're going to have a missions week. Our missionaries are going to be here. Uh, so plan to be here. Nate Miller will be here from South Dakota. Uh, Wes is going to give us an update from Cambodia, and we're also going to have Josh Austin from Arizona give us an update on the work uh, in Arizona on the, on the reservation on Wednesday night class next week. So uh, come be a part of that. I also want to remind you that a week from this Thursday, we have our lectureship starting. Uh, I've heard in the past that the lectureship is for the school. It is not. It's actually for uh, everybody in the western U.S. We have people that come here from all over the western United States to share with us, but it's for you. Uh, so come and study. We're going to be dig digging deep into the Psalms. It should be a, a very uplifting and encouraging time to see old friends, see old alumni that come to town, but also to get to connect with God's word, uh, especially as we study the Psalms. There are sessions for women, there's sessions for the youth, uh, there's sessions for everybody. So make uh, plans to come be a part of that. Also, one other reminder, and that is the family retreat that's coming up in early November. Uh, the elders really feel like the, the family retreat is such an important part of our annual work together. Uh, if you haven't come to a retreat, you need to. Uh, it's just a great opportunity to spend time together, to be enriched with one another, to spend time together as a church family. Uh, so please plan to be there. We do need people to make their reservations by, and get those paid for by October 1st. Uh, we had to commit ahead of time for the number of rooms, so uh, please, you can do that through Realm and make, make time to be there on November 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Uh, you won't be disappointed. It's a great weekend to spend together. I also wanted to provide one bit of clarification. The elders are considering repassing emblems again, but we need somebody, we need a group of people that will help us prepare the emblems, not just pass the baskets we already have men passing baskets for the collection, but we need people to help us prepare those emblems in a clean and safe and hygienic way. Uh, and we need to, uh, folks to step up and help us do that. So if you're interested in helping us do that, just let one of the ministers or one of the elders know that uh, you'd be willing to help us do that. In addition, we, we also have a number of folks here. I see Don Bevilacqua back. Uh, we know that Don has struggled through his surgery and through the pain that he's been dealing with. It's great to see him back with us and uh, standing in the back. Give uh, Don a hello and hug his neck and tell him we've been praying for him. It's good to see you back, brother. Uh, I also see Don Stapleton sitting back in the back as well. And uh, others, Rhonda is here with us. So many that come together to worship God, even when their physical bodies are giving them grief, they're here to smile and encourage us, and we hope we can smile and encourage them as well. Look around in the pews near you. We know that we all sit in the same pews week after week. Is everybody in your pew? Is there somebody missing? You would notice if they were because we sit in the same places all the time. If you notice that somebody's missing, give them a call. Let them know you missed them. Let them know that you're thinking about them. Find out if they're okay. Check on them. That's all part of this one another issue, isn't it? Being in each other's lives and noticing when, it, when folks aren't here and reaching out to them. So take an opportunity to do that. As we close this worship assembly, let us close it in prayer to our Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we've had this morning to lift our hearts in song to lift our minds in worship and to dedicate and re in some ways rededicate our lives to you and to uh, express to you our love and devotion to you and for everything that you've done for us. We thank you that we've had an opportunity to look into your word and understand what you would have us do and be with one another. Father, we pray that you would help us take the spirit that is with us, the spirit that you've provided to us, to out into the world with us, Father, that we would carry it out into uh, the world and share it with those that don't know you. Father, there's a, such a dark world out there, and you bring such light to our lives. Help us shine that light in the lives of others. Help us always look to you for direction. Help us always to look to you for guidance in everything that we do. Help us always remember the sacrifice that your son made that makes all of this possible. 
that sacrifice that joins us in fellowship through his blood. Father, we are so grateful for everything you do for us. It's through your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Don't forget to come back tonight as we worship God again at 5 o'clock. Thank you.